Now. Hi, I'm Lee Chantel from VivaLaVegan.net. I'm Chris. And today our guest we have with us is Jeremy Staples. And Jeremy is actually the person who suggested that Chris and I start this podcast. So it's very exciting for us to have you here, Jeremy. How are you? I'm doing well. It's, uh, it's good to be here and um, actually, uh, I don't know, I guess it was quite an offhand comment, but I think, I don't know, I think both you guys are, I think it's just a good combination of uh, humour and, and seriousness. Yeah. And I think two people who I see as doers, you know, you talk about stuff and you actually do it. So it's definitely something that I respect. Thank you. That's yeah. lovely. And um, we were speaking about Jeremy in some of our previous podcasts as well. I hope you've heard them. Chris and I did one on Japan for our first podcast. And we did a second one with Corey, Corey Leverton, um, who writes for Men's Health. And we spoke a lot about Las Vegas and various other things. And um, we mentioned that Jeremy, who's our mutual friend, was, on, was in New Zealand doing a um, cycling trip around there for five weeks, wasn't it? Yeah, five weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll talk a bit about that today. So did you, did you bring a map? I did. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure how that's going to... Can we start off with the map and then we'll ask questions as we go? <laughs> I love maps. Come on, have you got it? <laughs> it's just a big map. I don't know how it's going to translate on at such a tiny screen. but um, uh, Just hold, hold it up. <laughs> <laughs> and if people are just listening to the audio, you can have a look at youtube.com forward slash vivalavegan.net for the visual. <laughs> and uh, Lee Chantel will edit this in, so it's just a map right now. <laughs> oh, no, I won't. No editing, Chris. Maybe Is that I'll... Tasmania? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe put it back a bit. I'm not sure. What do you exactly want to see from it, Chris? I thought, it, I thought it might have been marked out of where it no, went. No, I, I haven't marked it out, but I've got a list of where I went. But the uh, the ride itself was roughly 2,500 Ks. Jeez. So do you want to tell us about about it, Jeremy? Like, where did, where did you go? Like, what was what was the reasoning for it? Yeah, I think it was, Five I guess... Five weeks, that sounds long. Yeah, I guess I did the trip as something as a bit of a reboot. For mm -hmm. um, I just finished working at a, an art gallery at Bundaberg. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Full-time work, I haven't actually had a full-time job in close to a decade. So full-time work was a pretty huge struggle and um, just needed to get out of the country and go actually have a real holiday. And it was, um, it was pretty funny realising that I actually haven't done a holiday that didn't, I guess, include other work elements. Mm -hmm. And even though my work, I guess, I don't know, I guess what I'm engaged highly with is self-publishing and predominantly zines. Um, I don't even know if I'd actually classify it as work. It's something that I love and very passionate about, but this trip wasn't about that. It was just about, I don't know, vagabonding and freedom of just riding around on a bicycle and seeing a place that I haven't been before. So discovering uh, an island and a culture that, I don't know, it was just a such a life-changing trip that, I don't know, it's, it's so hard to just explain it in a short period. But, um, yeah... Amazing. Cool. <laughs> so did you get into zoning whilst you were riding? You know? What do you mean instead, by that? Instead of it, like, you know, where it kind of becomes natural, where you're not necessarily focusing on the riding part and you kind of lose that bit where it's kind of frustrating that you stop riding all day, you know, your prostate hurts and whatever, <laughs> and you kind of just zone, you take in a lot of the experience, you know? Yeah, well, I think, well, well, let's cover the prostate bit. We've actually spoken about your bicycle seat already, and it, your, your, your bicycle seat is like, I was saying to LC that it's sort of like two it's seats. It's two seats. Yeah. It cups your bum. <laughs> it's like sitting it? on a cloud. However, I do get a bit, I gotta, if I do long distance riding, i got to shave my bum a little bit, otherwise it pulls the hairs out after a while, but... Yeah. Yeah. Well, go, go carry on. <laughs> Thank you for that visual. Yeah, I'll, I'll email you a photo for you to okay. flash up on the screen. We can do that. We can we can do that Fight Club sort of splash up sort of things just sporadically through the podcast. No, we're not. I don't like editing. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think the trip was just I I don't know. It was such an amazing experience, and I was explaining to Elsie beforehand that. The days were just so epic, like you'd get up at 8 o'clock and have some food and go for a ride, and the ride, you know, varied between, I don't know, 60 to 140 kilometres each day, just depending on sort of the the hills, it really came back down to the hills of just, but you know, the funny thing is, is after 
a while getting more um, south on the islands. So I rode around the North Island, so I didn't get to the south this trip, even though most people, I guess, tourists head straight to the south because it's uh, less developed and more landscapey and things like that. And But that said, I had an amazing trip on the North Island and um, I can probably say I've seen more of the North Island than most people who live in New Zealand. Wow. <laughs> but, but um, yeah, I think, you know, the hills were such a struggle early on, but it only took maybe three or four days to actually... I guess get to a certain fitness level and even just mentally just co- mm. taking on a hill that these hills aren't hills they're like six kilometer inclines mm. that just are just absolutely crazy and the thing was later in the trip where the southern part of the island where it was flatter I actually started missing the challenge mm. of like accomplishing this massive hill and yeah feeling like you've achieved something really amazing and did you set yourself goals like that like did you go this is how far i want to go in a day or this is where i want to aim for or did you have things booked along the way like i want to see this place or stay at this place yeah i guess i did a bit of research with i guess some places that i wanted to visit Mm -hmm. but i think as soon as i started booking things in for certain days the holiday became less of a holiday and more it became really demanding and the pressures of actually, okay, I need to do X kilometres this day. Mm -hmm. And I think that sort of... That only really happened at the end of the trip because I organised a a rental return car towards the end of it. But, um, yeah, I I think having that freedom to actually not commit to saying, oh, I'm going to go do this on this day, just that freedom of, like, actually I've got to this town and have found that, you know, it's absolutely amazing and I want to spend more time here or... You know, I think every sort of week, um, each seven days having a a day off or more in that Mm. period is uh, something that I sort of came up with. Yeah. And so for, um, like, what what were you doing? You were just cycling around? Did you just stay in places in particular? Did you stay by the side of the road under the stars? That's always good. (laughs) Yeah, totally. So I guess I should, a little bit of background with... The bike. So the bicycle had front and rear panniers, which are just the bags, um, and also some bags at the back. And I was set up so I could be fully self-sustainable. So I had cooking equipment, tents, you know, I actually had a, a little mini solar panel as well that I could charge bicycle lights, mm-hmm. um, a GPS, um, and a mobile phone and things like that. Mm-hmm. And um, But yeah, so the trip did entail, I guess, a Tasma- uh, in New Zealand, they call it freedom camping. So it is mm. um, just that more wild camping of just side of the road and things like that. And I guess New Zealand's a little bit more open to, I don't know, for example, hitchhiking is is legal. Mm. People do it and that's, that's totally fine. There's no laws or anything against it there. Um, there's definitely laws against camping in certain areas, but um, there's so much land there you can find a little spot behind a tree and be out of harm's way or visual way. So yeah, there was definitely lots of just freedom camping, but there's a lot of free camp spots as well. Mm. But also their um, conservation sort of parks and stuff like that also have sort of cheap camping as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. Any questions, Chris? You no, I'm right? just taking it in. <laughs> I'll just keep up with the questions then. <laughs> I'm sure you'll let us know if you have a question. Um, so where did you eat? Tell us about the vegan food. Oh, the vegan food. Yeah. It's... Tell us about vegan food on the road. That's what I'm more interested okay, in. Okay, yeah. Well, what was cool <laughs> is um, what the, the actual the second day I was actually in uh, New, New Zealand, I actually met up with a fellow vegan who was doing a year bicycle trip. Um, Michael. What? Yeah. So he's. Uh, so how long did you spend with him? Um, three weeks. So yeah, it was. It was. What was really cool was actually like every time I've been overseas, I've always done sort of a solo thing, and it it probably only dawned on me right towards the end that we we're traveling together that this was the first person I've actually traveled overseas with. So it was really cool to sort of I guess share that experience, mm-hmm. but also the early early during that ride of like the challenges of doing these big hills when you're not physically capable or Mm. probably even mentally just even seeing that hill and you know trying to conquer that and doing that together Mm. um but michael who um was was from amsterdam he um definitely a bit of a chef but also someone who ate a lot Mm. i joked around a lot and about how much food he ate but he was eating verging on a loaf of bread a day 
Um, huge, <laughs> huge metabolism. I feel reflecting on it, I feel like a bit of a bully that I um, gave him so much crap about eating so much bread. Um, but he loved his bread, and he was always trying to find a, a bakery that would like bake fresh, decent, mm. non-white bread. Mm. Bit of a mission, um, I'm sure. <laughs> but even just um, vegan food in a supermarket that are like uh, the mock meats and even tofu was definitely a bit of a struggle in towns outside of the bigger places. So sort of Fungaray, Wellington, and Auckland, you know, totally accessible. But it's funny, sort of the more touristy towns did have, you know, your tofus, your tempehs, your mock meats, and things like that. But the price of them, you know, Americans and travellers come to Australia and complain about how mm -hmm. expensive stuff is here. They haven't seen New Zealand where things are actually twice the price wow. of what they are. So what's a what's a thing of tofu worth? Uh... Um, I don't. I can't think of what a thing of tofu. But one thing that I did remember that I brought up was the, you know, those Kingland yogurts. So they're little tubs of yogurt that are probably yeah, yeah, yeah. Two hundred. Cool. There's, there's a pack of four of them. They're what 150, 200 grams. They were about twelve dollars. What? <laughs> yeah. And they'd probably be about six here or five, something like that, wouldn't they? Yeah. They're not a they're not a sponsor of you, are they, LC? <laughs> no, not yet. If anyone well, would like to be a sponsor, get in touch. Oh, they won't because <laughs> when I say <laughs> how much their food tastes like clay, like all of it. their food, I don't know what they do to their tofu, but <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Kingland, Soyland, I like your stuff. <laughs> But there is actually a, uh, a New Zealand organic vegan brand called Tunzu who do their sausages and they also do like a litre yoghurt. Um, but it's only, it's plain and it's unsweetened and... Um, what? So, yeah. I'd, I'd like that. I'd That's like, too I'd much. Like yeah. It's, um, I, I bought one once and I tried to buy it again but it was, I only ever saw it once in a shop and that was even like in Auckland, I couldn't find it. So... How, how long did it last? The, the yoghurt. Yeah, the leader. Did you mix it with stuff? I should, if I had anything to mix with it, I would have because it was just, it was bland. Yeah. <laughs> I always loved plain yogurt when I was younger. B BV before vegan, I always loved um, plain yogurt. So, yeah. Yeah. But mm. unsweetened as well. What kind of what kind of plain yogurt though? Like, are you talking like Greek yogurt, which is like acidic? Yeah, it's more acidic. I, I would say not it's like, Greek not yogurt. Not like I snack pack yogurt where it's yeah, like no, a, like just, a, when I when I was a kid, I was a huge Go Go Gorilla guy. <laughs> Do you know those things, that. like chocolate flavored ones. <laughs> oh my god! For some reason, my mum used to buy hundreds of them and freeze them, and I used to eat them like you know kids used to freeze poppers. <laughs> I used to eat them like that. They were delicious. We call pop um, juice boxes poppers over here in Australia. Yeah, there was juice there was. There was definitely a bunch of quirky things that, uh, you know, for listeners overseas, you know, I think everyone laughs about our, um, well, you'd call them flip-flops in America, right? Mm -hmm. And they're, they're thongs in Australia, but in, in New Zealand, they're jandals. Oh, okay. Um, uh, our very racist term of um, our cooler box mm -hmm. um, is the esky in Australia. But it's, is that racist? Why well, is that racist? It's, it's racist but towards the Eskimos, the, the actual... You wow! Yeah. I never thought of that. Esky, yeah, okay. yeah. It totally is. <laughs> yeah, I only realised that when I called it an esky uh, in America, and someone goes, oh, "I probably shouldn't say." That. Oh wow! Never thought of that. But yeah, yeah it's the chiller box in um, yeah. oh, the, the chiller bin. Chiller bin. That's right. The chiller bin. <laughs> Your friend on the fridge. <laughs> but, yeah. Was there any was there any uh, problems with the language barrier? Well, in I New think... Zealand. Because you know you can talk to a Kiwi and they have no fucking idea what you say. Yeah. I think the, the bigger issue was was the, I guess, the Maori language and the translation of the town names. Because towns that start with WH, like Fungaray, for example, is actually spelt WH, Whoa. whatever. Like, mm. so... Thunga as in TH. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, well, give me a look here. I can spell it out to you. It's actually spelt... W H A N G A R E I, but it's actually pronounced Fungaray. And same with our uh, Fakatani. It's W H. <laughs> what was that one? Yeah, you'd like that one. Fuck a no, There's no swearing. <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah, we did plan this to be um, 
non-explicit. Oh, right, but, but it's the name of the town. Now. It's the name of the town. <laughs> no, I'm just saying because of Chris. <laughs> <laughs> it's explicit. <laughs> I'm sure there'll be one that doesn't have swearing in it. The time <laughs> I'm <happens>. sick. <laughs> but what was cool is while I was riding around, I actually downloaded both uh, podcasts and uh, have some good memories of... Um, the first one, I was actually in a place called Kaikoui, um, which is in the Northlands above, uh, above Auckland. And it was at this um, geothermal spa. So there was cool. sort of seven different spas... Each spa was actually connected to... So these were natural spas um, connected to a sort of a different stream underground. So each stream had sort of different minerals in each oh, bath, God. but also different temperatures. So there was the... the I don't know. They were, had heaps of funny names, but one was the lobster, and it was like 42 degrees. Mm. It was awesome. So good. That's warm. Yeah. What's the hot one? Did they have like the hot spa? Yeah, they had a hot... 40, 45 degrees is warm. You know, and you go to there and they've got like a 53 degree one. Like, who sits in that oh. for long? So, is this in Japan? Because they've definitely got this. No, in New Zealand. In, ah. uh, you know, Lake Taupo. Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. yeah, too hot. Have too you been hot, there, man. Chris? Sorry? You've been to New Zealand? Yeah, we went there a few times when I was a kid. Mm. I went. I, kinda, I like it. I, I have mixed feelings about New Zealand, though, because it's kind of, there's so much to do, but it's almost impossible to ever go there on a holiday. You know, unless you're going to, like, a tiny spot, you know? So there's lots of traveling in between, you know? And if you just kind of go there and just relax, it's a much nicer place than mm. going there for a holiday. Yeah, that was def yeah, I definitely encountered lots of people who sort of just had a tick box, li tick box list where they would just literally get to that destination, take a photo, yeah. tick it off, and then get to the next one. And I think that's where the cycling... Because I did a small little bit of driving and... It was just such a different experience being in the car and not... Oh, oh don't touch that. <laughs> Chris is having some... Sorry. <laughs> is that Izzy? Hi, Izzy. Chris is... Like, hello. Obviously in she's getting in. Oh, she's Izzy. eating the cheese. Hello. Can you see her? Beach. Hello. Beach. <laughs> Say hello. Beach. Do you remember Jeremy? You haven't Beach. met him. No, I haven't actually met Izzy yet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, with so tell me, you got a bit of a list of what's that, where you've been. Do you want to tell us? Yeah, I guess I, I can quick, I quickly yeah. run down because it's it's not super exciting for others. I don't think. Well, I'm if you've <laughs> been to New Zealand or if you want to go to New Zealand, yeah. especially if you want to cycle, it would totally. Be like about. I think New Zealand does have uh, an, a great reputation for being a great cycle holiday destination, mm. a touring destination. Um, not all the roads are really made for it. There is not a lot of room to actually get off the road or mm -hmm. things like that. But I think um, I think there's a good challenges and just I guess since it is small in relative like terms, like comparing it to Australia. For example, <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, there was a number of cyclists that were doing holidays while I was over there from the UK. Lots of Germans mm -hmm. and yeah, lots of people doing it and. Uh, Met a, a Australian travelling around doing a cycle holiday and whatnot, but um, so pretty much. I <laughs> Fit here, Chris. <laughs> Chris is consuming some of his uh, homemade cheese that he was showing off earlier. Mm. And you know, there's nothing beats uh, watching some guy on a YouTube, uh, like a podcast, munching on food. <laughs> Don't put that microphone too close, man. We can hear everything. Can you? <laughs> No, not really. <laughs> so tell us about where you went, Jeremy. So yeah, so I went. I guess the, I went north of Auckland and um, spent roughly about two weeks uh, up there, traveling or through there. And um, what was amazing was uh, there was a part of the trip was a fifty-kilometer bicycle ride on the beach. Um, so it was low tide. The sand was rock hard. So most people, if they do know a little bit about New Zealand and cycling, they're probably thinking 90 Mile Beach was pretty much the, the tip up there. But this is actually on the west coast further down from Puto Point to Daggerville. Um, and it's sort of a, a bit of a tip off via one of the uh, cycling books that I got before going. And it was just absolutely amazing. But pretty much going up that coast and getting to the Waipau Forest, which is, I guess, quite famous for the curry trees, which are a very ancient tree that, you know, is the size of a small house, the base mm -hmm. of it. And unfortunately, logging has sort of destroyed mm -hmm. a large majority of it. And um, 
what's what's quite amazing about these trees is they've a lot of them have fallen down in swamps and been preserved over the years so you can get these amazing like wooden artworks like you can't actually cut these trees down anymore they're protected trees but lots of furniture and art and whatnot is getting made from these from the the preserved wood that's been rotting in there cool but yeah so and then i sort of got quite popular area is the bay of islands and did some sailing and some riding and snorkeling and stuff around there which was quite amazing um and then i guess i you know there's I don't know, it's so hard to sum this up in a short period, mm. but like getting back down towards um, our fungi and discovering um, some undeveloped caves. So, oh, that would be cool. Yeah, so pretty much an undeveloped cave, you know, I don't know, you've been to a cave before? Hell yeah. Yeah. And Who hasn't been to a cave? <laughs> well, there's probably tons of people. I hope people go to a cave now yes. if they have not before. Amazing. So these are undeveloped caves. So there's a bit of a, like a, a bit of a dirt track there. You know, a bit of signage saying, you know, stay safe and whatever. But generally, like, you get in this cave and there's no safety barriers, there's no steps, mm. there's no anything. And um, it just finished raining, so it was quite slippery and whatnot. But we're really glad went further into the caves and the, the sheer amount of glowworms were nearly, like, glowing the, the entire cave. It was just absolutely amazing. I love glowworms. Yeah, mm. so that was quite cool. And then, you know, getting further down, going through Rotorua, which I think that Rotorua and sort of geothermal area was definitely a highlight. Mm -hmm. I think all the natural geothermal pools and stuff like that, just, I don't know, There's no, it's something pretty magical of being in, like, a waterfall that's so hot and just natural and just, you know, and just knowing that the Maoris used these sort of locations to cook food or healing mm -hmm. and things like that. It's just really, really cool. Cool. Yeah. Did you have a favourite spot? Probably that, the geo. Yeah, I reckon yeah. all that. Like, I think yeah. that was probably a, definitely a highlight. But what about like, the smell? Ah, uh, you, you just, you don't even smell it after a while. <laughs> yes, you do. And it's in your clothes. It's gross. Yeah, you can't, that's one thing that was definitely a bit of a, and once it's in your clothes, it actually starts rotting your clothes as well. And oh, really? what? Yeah. Because <laughs> it's sulfur, right? Yeah, it's sulfur. So yeah, people who so don't know what we're talking about it, it pretty much smells like eggs. Mm. So the sulfur and um, but you know I think you just it doesn't smell like eggs. It smells like an egg fart. <laughs> the whole town smells like an egg fart. It's disgusting. It's. Yeah. I remember when, the first time I went there when I was a kid. My parents thought it was a hilarious, practical joke. <laughs> they, and they're like they were looking back to see if we were going. What the <laughs> is that? <laughs> uh, doesn't matter. That's a that's a story for another day. Yeah. <laughs> but I think another highlight, and it's quite popular as well, is doing the uh, uh, all these towns that just struggle with pronunciation. Mm. So I do apologise to anyone from New Zealand or anyone who actually knows how to pronounce these towns. <laughs> <laughs> but the um, the Tor Torregarigo Alpine Crossing, which is one of the it's one of the top ten day uh, walks in the world, and it's mm. just absolutely amazing because. You know, it's it became quite famous recently with I guess with uh, Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit because there's um, Mount Doom is which is one of their mountains that's you sort of go near. Um, but the walk, you know, there's two amazing lakes. There's also an active volcano, mm. and Mount Ruapehu, which was crazy. After the walk, I did a ride, a 60 kilometer ride, and it just got colder and colder mm. through the ride. And that next day, found out it actually snowed that night mm. on Ruapehu. So. This is the middle of summer for everyone who's who could be dealing with winter, but this is the middle of summer in uh, New Zealand. It's snowing and absolutely freezing. Mm, too cold for me, I think. Yeah. So what would you? What would be the tips you'd give if someone wants to do a similar sort of thing? What would you say? A lot of preparation. Did you do much preparation? Or? I think I think a lot of people freak out about level of fitness, and I don't think it's as much of a big thing. And I think these same tips would probably be utilised for anything, from mm. organising an art show to a f vegan festival mm. or whatever. Is I think just lock some dates down mm. um, in getting that down so you're aware of it. But I think the big thing is just being mentally prepared as mm. well. Like it's quite, it's quite a struggle when you are going up these eight-kilometre hills mm. and you're just looking at it and going, this is impossible. Yeah. Like getting your head down and I think there's so many great analogies to the whole trip which is just mm. like look at the ground and just pedal mm. as much as you can and, and break get... everything down yeah like, so small small bits process yeah. there yeah. yeah totally um and I think just having a few key I guess like having a few key destinations but realize that you may not be able to do them because mm. 
it's, you know, 600 kilometers away and things like that. But, yeah, I think going, having a bike that's, is capable of doing something, like, you can do it with any bike, but mm. there's definitely things that you want to have a, a reasonably versatile tyre that's not too thin, not too thick. So if you are doing dirt roads or on the road, like, it's not too disadvantaging either way. Mm. And did you bring your own bike over? I did, yeah. And that was quite... It was interesting. This was the first time I've travelled with my bicycle. And the process of getting a bike on a plane, so straightforward. It's just mm. classified as a standard piece of luggage. Ex- um, like extra luggage? Like the bigger one or not? No. You, oh, well, okay. it's, it's, it's classified, yeah. You do have to take it to the oversized yeah. thing. But if you've got, say, two bags as your part of your baggage, like that's just going to be classified as a, as a bag. Oh, cool. um, but, yeah, I, you know... A lot of people, you know, the issue is is if you're going to hire a bike and you're doing a longer trip, it's going to mm. cost more than that. So I did meet a lot of people who were buying bicycles over there okay. and they just sell them back once they've done their tour. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, no, I think just having uh, a bit of a time frame and adding some more time to it because I know if I, I probably needed another couple of weeks to feel like I could go see everything and stuff mm. like that. I'm um, getting a, a decent guidebook, but not totally relying on mm. it. Like, the guidebook I had was just absolutely amazing and lots of... I guess one thing that New Zealand's really great at is using old railway lines and use, turning them into bicycle tracks and things cool. like that. So that was really cool. Mm. But um, So, uh, like, talking technology, what kind of... um, You used a... What's name? Bike? Like a touring bike? No, well, I have. I've got what? a flat, a flat-handled road bike. So, and it's and it's not an expensive bike. I think I purchased it for maybe three hundred dollars. Um, yeah. So you know, it's. Um, I would definitely encourage having that flat-handled bike. Um, you can, you know, you're on holidays. You want to look around and see stuff. Mm. Like having a road bike, you're in a position where you're actually sort of looking <laughs> at the ground. Um, yeah, I did, I did see and it's it. bad on your bad on your hips, bad Absolutely. on your back. Absolutely bad. Like you'll be in a really bad shape at the end of a decent cycle. So you, you didn't have a touring bike, so you were kind of hunched over anyway. No, I was. I was sitting. I was sitting in a like it. It is a like a cycle holiday touring bicycle. So it is flat handled yeah. with the extension bars and things like that. Um, but you know, it was definitely an. It's an entry level bicycle. Mm. But you know, I was riding with Michael who. You know, he had like a two and a half thousand dollar bicycle, cool. and it's set up for cycle holidays. Mm. And you know, I kept up; it wasn't an issue. So you know, you can do any of these, any sort of cycle holiday. You know, even if it's just a weekend away, like you, it's surprising how adapted you become when you. You know, I think I probably had about thirty five kilos strapped to all my bike, mm. and um, it just. You just didn't know any different. Like, yeah. as it just you just adapted to what you were push, pushing along. So, yeah. and did you lose weight? Were you losing any uh, losing muscle at all? No, I think I, I lost about five kilos, which is I think just in beer. But I was drinking beer every day, so <coughs> I put it back on. So, but you're definitely sweating lots. Like I was definitely drinking six to eight liters of water a day. Wow. Um, yeah. Because what's the weather? What's the weather like in northern New Zealand? Is it? Similar to New Ze- uh, similar to, similar to New South Wales, yeah, Victoria. Yeah, totally. Like when you further got further south, like Rotorua and Taupo and stuff like that, it was definitely getting a lot colder because it was a lot higher up as well. But what the, What's a lot colder? Um, like would, say nighttime, would it get down to like say ten degrees, yep, fifteen? Yep, yep, lower, lower. So it was single digits in in around these colder areas. But yeah. h- higher up, it was fine. It wasn't an issue at all. Like, um, I think lows was maybe sixteen um, in northern North Island, New Zealand. Yeah. Yeah, and what about daytime temperature? Um, it was definitely. It was you know it's the middle of summer as well over there, but it just didn't have the humidity and and it yeah. was and it was you know you know twenty to twenty five degrees. So yeah, like, that's perfect. That's my that's my kind of weather. Mm. Yeah, I could live I can live in that forever. Yes, twenty like twenty five during the day as a maximum. Yeah, that's fine. I hate twenty six degrees. Can't cop it. Yep. It's too hot. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm fine. Anything up to about thirty something, I'm okay. Yeah, no, it was definitely. Um, you know, I felt it today. Like I rode over here. And um, just the humidity, like it's just mm-hmm. gross. <laughs> like, like Brisbane's like a, I call it the urban jungle, like because it, it's just 
the humidity, like, it can be, like, 90 to 100% sometimes. Like, it's just gross. <laughs> and you miss some... Oh, no, you were here. It was horrible the heat weather. Wave, we, yeah. had, we had some very hot days, and we've just had some raining for a few days. Did you hear about the cyclone and everything over here, Clay? Chris? Yeah, everyone, everyone talked about what it. A, did you hear about the earthquake? There was an earthquake? Where? Yeah. Where? You Where? Didn't get, there was, a, there was a, like, a level 5... Oh, uh, yeah, in Maribara. Oh, uh, yeah, Maribara and Bundaberg. I guess I'm plugged into all the Bundaberg stuff at the moment due to just finishing work there. But, yeah, and but Brisbane also got hit as well. It was 2 o'clock in the morning maybe a week ago, and Brisbane it was very mild. It was like a friend just mentioned yesterday that his house creaked for about a minute. Wow. Yeah. No, I missed that. It's wow. all happening. Yeah. <laughs> um, we've had an earthquake here since I've been here. It was awesome. Was it? Was it? No, nah, I, I didn't feel it. Mickey felt it. <laughs> I, when I was when I was in uh, Nara, just outside of what Kyoto is? Is that where Nara? I can. Nara, 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 Kyoto, yeah. Wakayama, Kobe. They're all like within half an hour of Osaka. Yeah. So when I was there, I, I actually just slept in a park, and like, because it's just so safe in Japan, like. Like, when I woke up, there was just, like, five other drunk businessmen sleeping around me with feral cats. <laughs> <laughs> Pissing on you. <laughs> but I was more worried about the deer. I guess the deer is what it's pretty famous for, because there's wild deer everywhere. And what, eating you? Or... Oh, just... Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> nah, not eating you, but... Yeah, the Pissing deers you. are pretty aggressive. I've, I've only seen it on YouTube. It's only half an hour away, but I've never been. Oh, you need to go, Chris. Take the family, man. Yeah, one day. Yeah. After it's a long way to go. I've been to the SeaWorld Nara Resort when I was a kid. That's halfway there, right? <laughs> Close. <laughs> Let's not talk about the animal cruelty associated with that, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, what have you been up to, Chris? Tell um, us what you've been doing. Yeah, nothing much. Just just working on the same stuff. Painting, vacuuming, making cupboards. Yeah, nothing, nothing, nothing as exciting as riding around New Zealand. <laughs> and um, have you heard about all the stuff that's been going on online recently? Maybe. <laughs> what kind of stuff? Well, the biggest thing um, the past week that's happened in Australia is the Greyhound Racing documentary. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. That yeah. was on Four Corners on the ABC. And if anyone doesn't know what I'm talking about, check out iview.abc.net.au. And um, they actually did uh, some uncovering of live baiting in the racing industry, the greyhound racing. And Jeremy, yeah. you actually watched a lot of it. Well, I, I, watch I it. See, I got the email. Chris, did you watch it? No, I haven't seen it, but I, I grew up next to greyhound race owners, so I know about live baiting and stuff like that. One of um, one of the greyhounds that was next door to us today and went on to win about six races in a row, so, you know, you can understand why they do it. However... I can't understand why it's still, you know, so Chris, a practice that we accept in Australia, you know? Well, I don't think it is at the moment because there's been a lot of uproar about it and a lot of um, sponsors and people have pulled out from um, sponsoring Greyhounds and the um, ex-captain um, of the Brisbane Lions AFL team, um, he actually just stepped down from his Greyhound Racing ambassador spot, Jonathan Brown. So I'm very, very happy about that. Yeah, did Plugger step down? Um, don't know. Is he another one? Yeah, he owns he owns heaps of greyhounds. There's quite a few sports people who do. I've yeah, noticed. Terry yeah. Hill. Yeah, when I when I was a kid, I, I wasn't I wasn't into greyhound racing, obviously, but yeah, it was something I heard a lot about because our next door neighbour was right into it. So Chris, it might be like I guess I didn't really know what the live when someone said live baiting, I didn't actually know what that actually mm. was. Mm. Chris, what is live baiting? Well, from my understanding, and I certainly didn't see the documentary, but uh, live baiting something similar to giving someone, like, you know, like you give a dog a kill and they race faster or they kind of hunt after the rabbit, like, because, you know, greyhounds are essentially psychopaths, right? <laughs> like, they, they are, they're like, they're like trained to kill rabbits, right? So that's what that thing that goes around the track is, they're chasing that to kill it. Mm -hmm. You know that? You get that? Yep. So... Yeah, they give they give it a kill, and it's got that taste for blood mm. or whatever, and then it's more likely to run faster to get that kill because killing something such an adrenaline rush. Mm. I guess it's the same reason people go hunting and 
you know, killers kill people. Yeah, yeah it's, a, like, it's a massive but, adrenaline rush to kill so, someone or so, something. I've heard. <laughs> so I watched I watched the documentary. And I think I'm the only one that did, which is poor Out form. Of this, yes. Come on! I, like... I know what happened in it, and I followed what the aftermath of it, but I I just can't watch those things anymore. Yeah, I'm. Was it, was I right though? Yeah, pretty much. But what pretty expanding on upon that, like the animals are all alive. They're so they're strapping live pigs, possums, and rabbits to the actual machine that spins around. And, you know, they will allow the dog to have a bit of a chew before it starts running. And then they'll just let this poor defenceless creature just keep going around. And, like, it gets to a point where the animal is still alive but getting torn in half while it mm. still goes around. So, you know, it's I knew what was, you know, interesting while I would, you know, I tried, to, I avoided social media pretty much the whole trip. But when I was organising, getting back and all that sort of stuff, I jumped on and I just saw all these people who would never normally engage with any sort of animal mm. rights or activism and they were just po sharing and posting all the uh, the live baiting stuff. And mm. So I, I knew something was happening and then got the email from you guys saying, hey, this documentary is about to come out. And I definitely have to congratulate Four Corners, ABC. Mm. They did an amazing job uncovering but i think you know thanks to all the i think people. i think all those stories are done by animals australia yeah and then, that one was animal liberation i believe oh, okay but yeah they're definitely stories that i think they lobby very hard for the abc to put those on mm -hmm. or to do a story on them and yeah I, I don't necessarily think it's the abc you know making a decision to start doing stuff like that i think they're being lobbied very hard by those groups yeah, I think... It's still it, good that they can do it. Yeah, well, yeah, I think it's just good that they actually made it happen, which was quite cool. And it was obvious, you know, tons of people who were, you know, doing direct action and getting in there and putting a lot of cameras and getting this footage. And that footage, you know, is now getting used in courts, mm. you know, processing people. And, you know, the people who are multi-millionaires via Greyhound Racing mm. are now facing a two-year sentence, mm. which... And they've fired a lot of people from the industry as well and... Um, yeah, it's. I, I guess it's good. Like for me, the the issue is like we shouldn't be using animals at full stop, and it doesn't matter whether or not you're live baiting an animal. Like I disagree with greyhound racing, um, you know, on a whole. And there's so many different aspects to greyhound racing that are also bad that I wish maybe they would have, you know, gone over those a yeah. bit. Like instead of just it being one sort of aspect of it. But you know, obviously. It, it's got out to people that wouldn't have paid any attention, like you said, people who are not totally. activists or something. And yep. similar to all that live trade stuff that happened a few years ago, which was an Animals Australia operation, and yep. um, there was a lot of social media stuff with that. And I don't think it's as big as that, obviously, no. but I think yeah, a lot of people are talking about it. Yeah, I, I think... I don't know, I can, I get, can I give you an interesting, uh, an interesting take on why it's not as big as that? Why? Racism. Yeah, because it's not about overseas. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I definitely think that that was much bigger because of the religion involved and the country involved. Yeah, well, that, yeah, definitely. A lot of people were saying, well, that doesn't happen in Australia. That happens in other countries. So yeah. that was a massive and it, issue. Yeah. Okay. And it really, it really cropped up around about the same time. They were having horrible troubles with uh, people coming here on boats or coming to Australia on boats, you yeah. know? So the government really kind of yeah. like, it was something they could cling on to to show that they were doing something, mm. you know? So I think they really played on like race tensions as well as, you know, no, I don't think it was necessarily much to do with um, animal rights is what mm. people tend to think it was. Well, I think it's not th like saying it's about animal rights, but just taking anything that's um, talking about these issues that's normally not in mainstream media. Like, that's always a positive thing. And to get the discussion happening is always good. Mm. And whether or not something happens from it, like I remember with all the live trade stuff, there were so many people that were so anti that, and you know the trade was stopped. I think it was ten days, but now it you know it happened again, and there's still people talking about it. And you know the the aim. I'm not sure what the aim was with that, and what actually came from it. Whereas this, at least people you know are losing their jobs. Definitely, you know they've been fined. People are pulling sponsorship money out. There is, but there is so much that, like, 
that's kind of similar to that. I think horse racing, you know, there's so many horses die every year. You hear about the one that dies during the Melbourne Cup. You never hear about the 25 that happened the day before. Well, I think it was good this year, though, Chris, that, you know, there was three horses that were put down, and mainstream media covered it exceptionally well. Like, I think it was actually a bigger news story than who actually won the race. Mm. So I think that was really a, a big turn of events where normally it's something that they try to do behind the scenes mm. and don't even speak about. Um, yeah, let's just not bring our friend Lugsy talking about his horses and stuff into the game, hey? <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think... But that- yeah, like, I got... The thing is, he doesn't do that because he hates animals, you know? He does it because he loves animals. You know what I mean? Like, it's such a it's such a difficult thing to talk about, mm. you know? Particularly when it's something... When it is something like that, you know? It's very, like, it's very difficult to ever have the conversation. Well, I, ha- I have the conversation quite a bit with him where, you know, and he's, you know, he he's quite, you know, he's not defensive about it, like, but he'll back up the level of care that goes into that horse. Like, yep. there's a goal. No, but he, but he does it because he loves the horse, right? He loves his horse. I think he likes you know? the thrill of it all and, like, I don't know what he, but, like. But, like, he loves the whole lot. He doesn't do it because he hates the horse. Definitely not, no. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think people eat bacon because they hate pigs mm. you know they there's a lot of there's a lot of things people do where they kind of you know they can't they, everyone needs to be able to wear two hats at any time you know the the one that does does the thing and the other one that kind of makes an excuse for it you know and we all do it like i make excuses for everything like at the moment i'm ignoring someone that i know is here in japan that i could like i could go and hang out with but you know i kind of don't want to <laughs> you know what i mean so yeah, it's real, like, we kind of yeah. always wear two hats. Well, I think it's, it's, I don't know, like, the Greyhound Racing, you know, documentary that got shown recently, like, the thing that they were really pushing was, like, the poor defenceless animal was strapped to the thing, and I'm like, the majority of viewers, they eat bacon, or they eat these meats that are getting strapped to the thing, or they, they'll hit a possum and not think too mm. much of it. Like, yeah. I think it was quite contradictory of, like, that angle that they were pushing, and that link of like I don't know just like when people actually see the cruelty compared to the processed mm. item that they purchase in the shop that is so disconnected from a living being I yeah I think it's just outrage in general there's so many people that just want to be outraged about everything because then it's not them they're not taking responsibility of it at all they're just going oh it's that person's fault it's that company's fault it's this industry's fault and you can get as outrageous as you want about anything it's just another thing to be outraged about greyhounds this week kim kardashian's butt a few weeks ago (laughs) there's always going to be something Kim, kim kardashian's what her butt her buttocks all right. Terrier. Yeah. Did you see the? Front what were end? people complaining about it for? <laughs> well, she was full on naked with oil on the front of a magazine cover, and it was, ex- you know, people either loved it or hated it, but they had an opinion. Yeah. Chris is disappointed <laughs> that he didn't get the issue. Yeah. I, I just think I really hate at the moment. Doesn't matter what it is. You have to. You're either with something or you're against it. Do you remember yeah. George Bush and? The, like yep. early 2000s was always like you're with us or you're with yep. the terrorists you know like there's lots of things at the moment like I'm very pro what like very pro gender equality but I really don't like what a lot of feminists put out on Facebook as their key issues you know uh, like certainly I'm very anti-religious and I fully de- but I fully defend everyone's right to have whatever crazy religion they believe in but yeah I think that there's a lot of like duality you know is it duality is that the word yeah there's a lot there's a lot of duality in everything and i think it goes back to the greyhounds you know where they kind of it's either right or wrong you know glenn mcgrath going hunting to kill elephants you know why is an elephant any more important than a pig Mm. And that was quite a few years ago too. My sister was just telling me about that before. And um, who is he? A he's a cricketer, isn't he? Grandma Glenn Yeah. Yeah. And his wife passed over from cancer, and he set up a cancer foundation for her. All pink washing, um, but um, that's come out that he killed some elephants or something in Africa in 2008, I believe. And now mm. it's quite, you know, almost eight years ago yeah. and um so why is that a problem now i don't understand mm. that yeah and it said that he apologized like 
He didn't look very apologetic, <laughs> smiling next to an animal holding a gun, going, hey. <laughs> you know, like even if you are sorry, you did something. You know, you're not sorry about. You're sorry about getting caught. That's what you're sorry about. But also, like people change over the years too. Like if he did that in 2008, some of the stuff that I did in 2008, I might not agree with anymore, or might not do anymore. So you know, I think people need to be a bit more um, accepting or trying to understand people a bit more. Yeah, I got nothing. Yeah. I, I, compl- I completely disagree. I think, fuck him. He, should, he shouldn't have done that. I think it's a horrible thing to do. He can eat a dick. I'm never donating to breast cancer ever again. Well, so. I wouldn't in general because most of it funds animal testing. And it's just what I see pink washing and um, it's ridiculous. So I don't, I definitely... Is, pink, is that what you said, pink washing? Yeah, pink washing. Is that what pink washing is? Yeah, it's like green washing. It's people that are saying they're helping charities and they put pink all over everything. And does anything actually happen? For it. Is that actually a thing, or do you yeah, make it up? Pink question. No, I can't take. I, I can't think Lee Chantel. I, I mean, Lee Chantel could have made that up. We all know how much pink she wears or uses on websites. Unbelievable. I didn't come up with a name, <laughs> but yeah, it's. I don't agree with anyone killing any animals whatsoever. And um, but yeah, it's just the same thing. Like you were saying, why is a why does an elephant differ from a dog differ from a, a cow? Like they don't. So. I'm glad you said cow, not cat. Because if it was a cat, I literally don't care if a cat gets hit by a car. I <laughs> do cats. not care. Yeah, you don't like cats, do you? No. Cats <laughs> what, what did they ever do to you? Piss in my house. I hate cats. What did cats ever do for anyone? It's such oh, a ridiculous pet company. to domesticate. They're so love. But why do we need to domesticate animals? We don't. Because uh, people love crap pets. Mm. Like dogs. I get dogs. I know why people have dogs. I know. You're in yeah. Jap- you're in Japan, man. You can go to a shop and buy a, a wallaby or an owl in a pet store. I I, I haven't seen that. I haven't seen any any exotic pets. Yeah, I when I was over there, I saw an owl and something else that shouldn't have been in a pet store. I I haven't seen a, a the wallaby, but friends have seen a wallaby in a pet store. Yeah, I've I've actually heard a lot about it. I know I've seen a guy who's got like a falcon. Out the front of his house, but he kind of takes for a walk, and the falcon's got like a little thing around it. He like unclips it, and it flies up the street and flies back. You wow. know, yeah. But like such a crazy pet. Who has a falcon as a pet? Mm. Well, such should. a crazy pet. Mm. Yeah. I remember actually when I was in Ubud in Bali, and that um, a lot of the people over there would just help hold these animals captive, and so some of my um, Chinese Buddhist friends I was over there with. Um, they took me to a place they thought I'd really like because, you know, they all liked animals and stuff like that. And there were tigers, there were macaws, all these, like, exotic animals in these tiny little cages just in the middle of the street somewhere next to, like, a bakery or something because we had to go to the bakery to get maybe full moon cakes or um, something like that. And I'm just like, this is ridiculous. And there was a deer just walking along and people were coming in and out. And it's still it's still painful in my head, actually. But they tried to um, stop the person who owned them. They tried to stop him from having the animals there and find him or something. Yeah. But then when he didn't do anything, the animals just wouldn't eat. So it's like the government or the local sort of government didn't really have anything they could do from it. Once the animals are sort of um, bought, yeah. they, they have no control whatsoever, which is really sad. And you'd be pleased to know, Chris, um, we were also talking about our friend Nigel and his partner who'd been to Japan recently. So they yeah, had yeah. a really good time. So Nigel and and hopefully his girlfriend Christina will join us on our podcast in the future. Oh, excellent. So I, I lent them um, my uh, little tip guidebook just before leaving. Mm-hmm. So... Hopefully that was some use. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he said he found it. He, he got three or four places okay. from there. So it's all, we're all interconnected. <laughs> See how everyone's connecting. <laughs> yeah, Steve Park. <laughs> it's qu- quantum qu- connectiveness. Is it? Mm-hmm. No, not really. Deepak Chopra is a friggin' snake oil salesman. 
Well, it's just good to connect people that have like-minded interests or who are going overseas and doing similar sharing, stuff. Sharing and advice and stuff. I think that's always yeah. good, yeah. You, you were quite doom and gloom about Japan and mm. vegan, which I can totally understand. But you know when you're here, like, you know, you go to Melbourne, like, I didn't try all the places that I could have in Melbourne, yeah. you know? Like, if I went to a different one every week, maybe I could have, you know? But I didn't I didn't try them all because there's so many. There's, like, 67 places or something. And, like, there seems to be a new one every week. But, like, you know, in Brisbane, I kind of tried them all because I lived there for mm. 30 years. Here, I tried them all the first week, mm. you know? So you like, should have paced yourself? Is that what you're saying? What? And then have them all tried by the fourth by week? By a month, yeah. And then just replay. <laughs> Go back. But, yeah. You, and you, you none heard of them the news about Kuan Yin? Yeah, horrible. And Kuan but they're, they're doing like uh, the home, home del delivery or something. So tell yeah. me what Kuan Yin is, Chris. Uh, the best, in my opinion, the best vegan restaurant in Australia. So or was all... was the best vegan well, restaurant. It, there's a number of reasons why I'd probably agree with that because just the the cheap, how cheap it is. Value for money. Value for money is phenomenal. Like main meals were like ten bucks, mm. and like that remember, was... like say five years ago, six ninety for mm. a full meal. Crazy. Yeah. That was crazy. I remember going there and spending uh, like forty seven bucks and like feeding me, my mum, my dad, my grandma, my brother, my sister, you know, it was extremely cheap. Oh, my sister-in-law. Remember but, when like, we did that big, like, there was like 20 of us or something, and we, you know, yeah. some of your friends, like, punk, uh, was it the straight edge people were on tour or something, and yeah. and we all went there, and um, because we had the table who ordered or ate the most, we had our photo <laughs> up on the wall for years, the and wall now of fame. down. Oh, yeah. no, I forgot about that. But, you know, someone broke that about three weeks after because of, um, we, we were the second, I think. No, we, oh, we, 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 had, we had the record yeah. and then someone broke it, like and another Triple Z group. Ah. <laughs> Bastards. <laughs> oh, yeah, about Triple Z. Hey, the kids with class, it's just not the same without you, my friend. Really? Yeah. And yeah, I've, I've heard class? that. What's four tri Tell people what four Triple Z and kids with class is. Oh, I, I think I think I have before. Uh, Triple Z is the greatest radio station in the world, and in my opinion, Kids with Class was the best show. But so Four Triple Z is the local Brisbane radio station that you can find on four little number Z Z Z Z Z um, dot org dot au. That's I the one. Yeah. yeah. And what's you the Kids with it. Class? So that was a show that Mr. Chris Jackson was on, mm. and um, yeah, you can you can feel. He, Chris has actually got a Four Triple Z tattoo. Like, he's quite <laughs> dedicated to yeah. the cause, you know. I, I, is, love, I love Triple Z. It's, it yeah. is a true community radio station. The shows that are on there is from prisoner shows that are, like, letting prisoners do shout-outs to family, mm. um, requesting songs to queer and transgender shows mm. to... But ha have you ever listened to a radio station that's more from the heart, you know? Yeah. There's, like, I've, ne I've never come across a bunch of people that are as genuine as the people there, you know, like you could, you could go and do a an animal rights show on there if you wanted to. There's an anarchy show. There's a show about uh, local art. There's a local sports show. Yeah, it's seriously an amazing place, and I can't wait for when Jeremy has his show there. <laughs> Which it'll have to happen soon. I think. I think. I think having a show about. You know, like community works. Like I think that's what your show would be. I don't think you could do a zine show, but it'd suck. <laughs> I'd, I'd be down for that. I such a big supporter of that radio station. It is just such a platform for refugees or anyone that just needs a platform to uh, voice their anything. It's yeah, it's such a great station, and you know you can stream it. So yeah, do check it out. Um, but yeah, you know why not go? You know, do something on your your local community radio station. I do know mm. that like. A lot of community radio stations are old people reading the newspaper out. Why not go change it? Go, like, you know, go become a member and, like, suggest a show, you mm -hmm. know? it's I know growing up in Toowoomba, uh, Fort EDB was the community radio station there, and um, I had a show for a year or two there, and it was just a lot of fun, and it built a little community, and, you mm -hmm. know, I think that's what the radio re is really great for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if, if you think about it, I think uh, I wouldn't know... 90% of the people that I know now 
if it wasn't for that radio station, people I met through it, people I met through the local music scene, mm-hmm. people I met, like the Home Fest people, yep. you know? I think Home Fest was definitely through, uh, what's his name? Definitely through Triple Z, because yep. I think I met Lee Chantel through Triple Z. Well, not through Triple Z, but, you know, a Triple Z connected thing. Yep. So, we, yeah, we a, a lot of stuff in my life. We met through Sea Shepherd people. Yeah, but I kind of got involved in Sea Shepherd through Triple Z. So, yeah. 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 A, lo- a lot of stuff happened through that. It was, very, it was like the Ramones, you know? Like, the Ramones went through a town, and all of a sudden there was 15 great punk bands in that town, mm-hmm. you know? And I think that's what Triple Z's like. I think there's, you know, so like so many wonderful roots were, or so many seeds turned, like, turned to trees or some, whatever, whatever yeah, happened. Yeah, totally. I think, you know, Brisbane is a place that, like, lots of things sort of grew from that are quite special. I think, for me, I'm quite passionate. And one day there will be a documentary, a really good documentary about the Saints, for example, where, you know, yeah. people can say, like, they, they could be the first true punk band. And, you know, like, it's just amazing that, like, a backwater town in Australia, like, released the first ever seven-inch punk single, like, even before, you know, The Damned or any of these other you know, legendary punk bands that this band that, you know, are, you know, in the underground circles, the Saints are an amazing band, but in the mainstream, the mo- majority of people have no idea who they are. They know two songs. Yeah. <laughs> and one of them's a Radio Birdman song. Yeah. <laughs> what are your plans for the rest of the week? Uh, still painting. Yeah. I got so a ridiculous amounts of painting to do. Uh... So, did I say I did the foot first coat today? Yeah, you said you did that. What did I say? I finished painting? I, I finished the first coat today, so yep. tomorrow we're going to do a much bigger coat than uh, later in the week. Um, yeah, I don't know. Screw, so, screw some beds together. So, your and backpackers then, is called Swear Words. Are you going to... No, it's, ac- it's actually going to be... The first one's going to be called Four Letter Words, and it's okay. just a pop-up. Okay. I'm going to do it pop-up style, and I've, got, I've kind of organised... Uh, like a little bit of media around it being a pop-up backpackers and mm. from what I can tell everywhere like doesn't matter where it is on the face of the planet I can't find another pop-up backpackers anyway. So, how's it a pop-up? How is it a pop-up? We got some tents in a backyard and you're gonna take them down? What are we talking here? No like it's a it's a little tiny bit clandestine you know like we're setting it up we're using you know Japanese is uh, Japan's famous for having uh, very rigid laws that are like chock a block full of loopholes. So we're operating within a loophole, you know. So yeah, it's it's very clandestine and yeah, but cool. It's gonna like it's gonna be cool. It'll be you know like a, a good B and B, but with a backpacker vibe. Cool. And you know, yeah. pop up to some people, it just means opening a space for a short amount of time. So it's a good yeah, that's a good way. That's, yeah. that's how a lot of like say vegan eateries and that start. Yep. Yeah, and th- this is definitely just, so I've worked for like the last 10 years of my life having shitty jobs that I've always hated and I've kind of made enough money where I can invest in something and kind of do it without really getting a loan, you know, mm-hmm. so I can open this place up very cheap and use this as a stepping stone to opening up a much bigger place. Mm. Yeah, so it's also a massive learning. I've never owned anything like this before, so, you know, a bit of a learning curve for me. Definitely. Good luck with it. Keep us keep us updated. Hey, Jeremy, have you got like a top five or something to give us? A top anything? five. Yeah, oh, a top five. What? Yeah. So I I wrote, I wrote a bit of a eaten. a bit of a list of the top. I guess I think it's top four or five places that I ate um, while I was in uh, New Zealand. Um, have you ever been to the Sunflower Thai place in Auckland, Chris? Uh, I've been to Auckland twice and like both times for flying out. Ah, uh, okay. So have you, have you been to New Zealand, LC? I, as a youngster, uh, where, with the family, cool. when I don't really remember. The only thing I remember is I was coughing or something, and Dad shut me outside of the <laughs> of the van or whatever we were staying in. Because so, you were too loud. Because I was coughing all the time or something. So, wow. Um, that's- that's that's choice, bro. Nah, <laughs> that's pretty harsh. Yeah, actually, talking um, about choice, bro. The number, of, the the New Zealanders have adopted g'day. Really? The, what? The number of people that said g'day to me and, just and because you were Australian. No, they oh. before even opened my mouth. Yeah. Really? What what about a uh, hard out, bro? Hard out, uh, no choice and bro, definitely mm. sweet as you know, plenty of that action. 
Mm -hmm. But yeah, the Sunflower, which is an Asian place, very similar to Kuan Yin. So I was, you know, I was mourning the loss of Kuan Yin, and I could actually get this uh, Sunflower tired stuff, which was awesome. Because I just went through Hamilton, which is about, I think it's about 40 minutes an hour out of um, Auckland. They've got a, it's it's actually just called Vegan Buffet. Yeah. And the way that they work it is you fill your plate up and they weigh it. Yeah, I love that. And oh, you yeah. the weight. Chris, when you go to Kyoto next, or whenever you do, there is a yep. there is a vegan buffet there. Is there? Yep. A vegan buffet? Yes. Look at, it, look at his eyes. <laughs> <Sorry, exactly. laughs> Hasn't had this for months. <laughs> wow. Book the Mickey. trip now. We'll Wait, go this weekend. Mickey, did you hear that? <laughs> is, it on, is it on Blue Cow? Happy cow. Happy cow. It should be if it. Ah, oh yeah. See, Nigel's got the book. I would look it up in the book, but it should be on Happy Cow. If you just type in, uh, actually, I tried to find it uh, like just via an internet search, and I couldn't find it. I mean, mm. but it should be on Happy Cow. We'll have to ask yeah. Nigel about that. Yeah. So Vegan what are the profit. other? You said about sunflower, um, Jeremy. And we got yeah, um, trend, totally like, sidetracked. Completely sidetracked as we do. But yes. what are the others? So there's an amazing handmade dessert shop that does mm -hmm. three or four vegan desserts that mm -hmm. are just it's these decadent desserts that you know you you know the hours of preparation and stuff like that, and it's actually right next to the Britomart uh, main train station. So it's mm -hmm. actually I think it's nearly attached to the space. I think it's called Melise. I think it's called so amazing. Yeah. The, the ice creams and little desserts. Cool. So good. Um, in Wellington, it's sort of like. I don't know, there's the, the... Wellington, a lot of people will describe it as a little Melbourne. Mm, and it, it cool. sort of is. It's a pretty hip and cool. And mm. every all the cool kids hang out on Cuba Street. And it's sort of a little bit overwhelming when you've uh, spent, like, four weeks camping in the bush. And mm. um, Did you did you know that Wellington's got more cafes per head of population than anywhere else in the world? I did. I, yeah, I, heard, I heard that and also something else as well that was, like, also bars, I think, as well. Like Really? Bit, yep. Like, because that's one thing that I really did enjoy. The craft beer in New Zealand, they're going crazy. Mm. Like, there is so many craft beer brewers in New Zealand yeah. that are doing some amazing beers. So good. I yeah. went to a I went to a pub. Is Hamilton near Wellington? No. Hamilton's like an hour from Auckland. Oh, is it? Yeah. What else is near Wellington? Lower Hutt. Yeah, Lower and Upper Hutt. Yep. So I went to a bar in Lower Hutt. Or Nelson. Is Nelson at the top? Nelson or Picton, one of the ones. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, lower hut or upper hut, the first one you get to, I went to a bar and it was segregated. That is a segregated bar there. This is like in 2005, maybe 2004. Oh, that's Holy. crazy. Crazy. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Wellington, the little Cuba Street, that's just like, it's, you know, I call it like the Frankie, all the Frankie shops where you buy all the cute stuff and like the tattoo shops. And there's actually like an amazing vegan place there, Arnie Menas, I think it's what it's called. Awesome! I, I think mm. I ate there like three times. Mm. But it, it didn't make the top five. Definitely. This is. Yeah, he's still going through the top five. Definitely, oh, okay. definitely. Okay. That'd probably be one or two. Like it was so good. Midnight Espresso, which is a cafe, but huge amount of vegan stuff and their vegan desserts. Mm -hmm. Awesome! I mm. thought of you when I was having this mm. massive chocolate cake, and I'm just like. This is so good. <laughs> Seriously, such a good name too. Midnight Espresso. Yeah. And um, I think um, one thing that I actually discovered, that it's a New Zealand burger chain, but there's actually one in Brisbane, which I'm quite stoked about. Um, burger Fuel. Um, they have three veggie burgers, and they actually have it on the menu as like, and it's actually written to make this vegan do this, and they're using a separate grill, mm. no cross-contamination, right. so they're very, like, it was just nice to, like, I don't know. We all know what vegan cafes and restaurants are like. They're all operating on these hippie hours and closed on stupid days. <laughs> Burger yeah. Fuel, just, you know, it is the comparable to your fast food chains. And they do th three different, like, vegan burgers. Wow. So I'm going to go check that out in Brisbane. So where as well. is that in Brisbane? At the Emporium. Okay. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, I heard, I'm actually like, really craving a burrito recently, so I'm really looking for the best vegan Mexican in Brisbane, so please tweet me or, or um, email me if you know why it's the best. What do you think is the best, Chris? I love Guzman Y Gomez. No. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah. Why not? I just like, I like, because uh, you know it's kind of like, it's uh, very... South Mexican style. Like I like fresh Mexican, yeah. but GYG is also like 
It's so earthy, earthy food, you know. But it's not as hot. I heard it's they don't spice stuff up a bit. No, I, I and it's and because it's, that's the way the food is. Like if you go to say Baja, that's Baja styles, like the coriander and the I lemon like juice. Coriander. But it just doesn't like it doesn't match because they use the spices and fresh. Mm. It doesn't taste right. But uh, <laughs> what's next? Chris, you introduced me to the uh, Californian style. Yeah, California style rolls the best. That, like that's Baja style, right? So okay. That's, that's so, like fresh coriander with uh, lemon juice and shit like that. Where was that at? But no, you, Tucker- I think the, the California style that I was talking about is the hot chips down the middle of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that, like, they have with. Yeah. Oh, no, I can't. Yeah. So good. No, I just want the beans and the rice and uh, all the other stuff. Don't want fried, deep fried potatoes. Ugh. It's oh, the- yeah, I, ha- I hate potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly when they're fried. <laughs> I Are don't you really kidding like me? Deep fried anything to be honest. I think like I I think my pick is probably the taqueria. Like it, this fresh ingredients and is that is that the one opposite the in, right center there? In the valley. Yeah. So the yeah, that's so that's Baja style. That's like real fresh. Yeah. Yeah. I like that stuff, but like if I'm gonna eat it every day, <laughs> if I had to choose one, Guzman White Gomez. Well, I guess it's good that it's it's accessible. Like it's sort of a. Is it an Australian chain? I don't know, but like I don't know. I think yeah, I think it was started in Sydney, but can, great. can you actually get burritos in your neighborhood? Yeah, there's actually one that's almost on my street. If I walk to the end of my street and then walk. So you've been to Shinsaibashi before? Yeah. I live east of Shinsaibashi. Okay. Right? So looking at the map, so if I walk directly west, I walk one street north and directly west, it puts me in this part of the town called Yotsubashi. Do you remember that? There was, a, area, there, yeah. there was a train line, so Shinsaibashi and Yotsubashi, yep. that's the, okay, it's the yep. station that's connected. Yep. And then if you come up from Yotsubashi Station, there's a Mexican place right there. And randomly, there's like a Mexican gift shop on the same street, like 200 <laughs> meters down with two people that don't talk to each other, don't know each other. Oh. Yeah, so you can, that... they can do you a vegan burrito, no worries? Yeah, they can do me a California style, wow. begrudgingly. Wow. Yeah. Yep. Good. <laughs> Coriander, avocado, they got the whole deal. Awesome. Good, yeah. sounds great. Um, yeah. So, I'm just going to... You'll have to come over, Elsie. I'm, You'll dude, love I'm it. Coming. I'm gonna Beautiful burrito, bike. so juicy. I'm coming over. I'm bringing the bike. I'm going to come and work for you. I'm going to do the whole experience. I'm coming. Yeah, awesome. I'd love to do a leg on the bike with you. Sweet. I've um, still. I, I've, I plan to do from the very north yep. and even like doing rowing. As well, or like row across the bay. Cool. But um, I heard it's a bit of it, like it's a real currenty, <laughs> like from Hokkaido to Honshu, like it's such a big current. You'd like go, you know, if you went right from the west part, you'd probably hit China. I'd just like to thank Jeremy Staples for joining us today, and you can see more of what he gets up to at Jeremy Sta- Oh, sorry, you can see more of what he gets up to at thestaples.com.au, and he's across all social media channels as well. And um, if you want to hear any other new podcasts, I um, interviewed Nick from uh, Progressive Podcast Australia recently, and he interviewed me as well. And you can find that on progressivepodcastaustralia.com. We talk about a lot of things like Facebook being evil, um, how to communicate better online, and many different things. And um, see YouTube for more. What do you love? I love how everyone that's into social media hates Facebook. Yeah. Like, <laughs> oh, it's pain, it pains me. Remember we were talking before about crazy double standards? Yeah. Well, you have the, the issue is, Chris, you have to be on there. Like, because the majority of people are on there, so you have to be there. So, um, thanks, Jeremy, for coming up with this great idea yeah, of Chris and I doing the podcast together. This okay. is the it's right actually thing. a lot more difficult with three people. Yeah, I, I got in there. I'm the third wheel. I but, like I, I, but I think fun. when, when the, your hostel backpackers is open and the stories that you're going to be able to add and the things yeah. you see and do, wow, the show is just going to peak, isn't it? Yeah. But, you know, the thing is, most of the stuff, like, if it's someone else's story, you kind of feel a little bit uncomfortable about telling it because they'll go, hang on a minute, that happened to me, not you, you know? <laughs> I don't, are people like that? I don't think so. As long as you're not saying mean things about them. Thank you very much, Jeremy Staples. Thank you. Thank you as always, Chris. 
Thank and, you. Um, make sure you download this on Podomatic, Stitcher, iTunes, Scatter Radio, etc. Or you can Down, watch us. download this one. Or, or you can watch. Download us. our other ones. She means. Download this and our other ones. Whatever. They've already downloaded. If they can hear that, they've downloaded it. <laughs> if they're hearing it, they might be just listening online, not actually uh. downloading. So yeah, Fair download enough. them all. If you'd like to be a guest, um, send me an email, and um, we look forward to um, sharing whatever we're up to at the next time we meet. Thanks. What's your email address, just for? The email address is email at vivalavegan.net. Um, if you'd like to contact me, please contact me through vivalavegan.net, um, or all or. or <laughs> or across all the <laughs> social media channels Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Google Plus, Pinterest, etc. Oh, I uh, see I think I think Pinterest is evil. Pinterest is so good. It actually it's like um, one of the best things to get traffic to your website. Most social media channels it's just all within the social media channel, whereas Pinterest <laughs> can actually link to your site. Ask Martha Stewart. She's had great success. Yeah. In prison. Okay, thank you, everyone.